accepts doctrines. Almost everyone pretends that the half of the Monroe Doctrine about the U.S. staying out of wars in Europe never happened. Half of the U.S. political establishment proudly promotes the Monroe Doctrine, meaning subjugation of Latin America, and by extension, the rest of the planet. The other half does the exact same thing, but less proudly, while declaring themselves opposed to the Monroe Doctrine. The notion that the United States can arrogantly dominate the rest of the Western Hemisphere long preceded its ability to do so, and was followed up, including in subsequent presidential doctrines, with the notion that the rest of the world was next. The U.S. and its NATO sidekicks now treat Africa similarly, and with similar results. How do these countries that manufacture no weapons or military trainers manage so many well-armed, well-trained coups. It's not even a mystery in U.S. discourse. It's just understood as a reflection on the backward cultures of Africa, which itself says something about the backwardness of a culture that isn't in Africa. <laughs> also 200 years ago this year, President James Monroe's buddy, Supreme Court Chief Justice John Marshall put the doctrine of discovery into U.S. law. The doctrine that the U.S. government, as a replacement for European governments, could steal any non-European land it wanted. Monroe was the leading militarist and warmonger of his day, but probably wouldn't have been needed had someone else been president. The people who developed the Monroe Doctrine justified imperialism to themselves with the following four ideas. One, we're opposing European imperialism, so we can't be doing imperialism. Two, anybody who had the chance would want to be part of the United States, so we're not forcing anything on anybody. Three, these people are subhuman animals or ignorant heathen who don't know that they want to be part of the United States, so we have to show them. And four, what people? These are empty lands. The story of U.S. conduct in New York State during James Monroe's presidency, 1817 to 25, probably lacks no outrage ever committed in Central America under the banner of the Monroe Doctrine. Monroe himself in 1784 had been the first member of the Congress of the Confederation to go to what they called West, taking a tour of New York State and Pennsylvania to explore the edges of the empire. When Monroe was president, nations of people who had assisted the United States in its revolution were forced to give up their land by their great father, President Monroe, in the interests of prof profitable corporations like the Ogden Land Company, facilitated by modern transportation improvements like the Erie Canal, built 1817 to 25. In Ohio, the U.S. bribed chiefs to sell lands. In Indiana, Native nations were forced out west of the Mississippi. Treating the doctrine of discovery as law meant that Monroe and his bloodthirsty subordinate, Andrew Jackson, could take land from people who could be said not to legally possess it. Marshall, later in 1831, would rule against the Cherokee Nation, citing the use of phrases like great father to claim that indigenous nations were related to the U.S. government, quote, as a ward is to his guardian. In his fateful speech, President Monroe denounced Russian efforts to claim non-U.S. territories on the West Coast as an outrage against good Republican governments and a threat to spread bad systems of government. It would eventually become the manifest destiny of the United States to take over much of North America in part to keep Russia out of it. If any of this sounds familiar, or if you are struck by how powerful and successful Russiagate or Ukraine war propaganda has been, it is because the tradition is long, broken principally by that moment when the Soviets defeated the Nazis, which we have all been conditioned to pretend never happened. 
This background can help explain why it has taken so long to see peace activism in the United States grow in opposition to the war in Ukraine. From a certain perspective, it is very strange that it has taken so long. Nothing in my lifetime has done more to increase the risk of nuclear apocalypse than the war in Ukraine. Nothing is doing more to impede global cooperation on climate, poverty, or homelessness than the war in Ukraine. Few things are doing as much direct damage in those areas, devastating the environment, disrupting grain shipments, creating millions of refugees. While death and injury counts during the war in Iraq, you will all remember, were heatedly disputed in the U.S. media for years. There is widespread acceptance that the deaths and injuries in Ukraine are already at half a million. There is no way to precisely count how many lives could have been saved around the world by investing hundreds of billions in something wiser than this war. But a fraction of it could end starvation on Earth. Last week in the New York Times, we read about villagers in Ukraine whose plows turn up weaponry in their fields from both the current war and World War II, still to this day. While Russians blowing things up and killing people is supposed to be understood as horrible or noble, depending which of those two wars the weapons came from, the poisons and the dangers left in the fields look about the same to the people who live there. Both sides of the current war are adding cluster bombs to the mix. And at least the U.S. side depleted uranium. From another perspective, it is clear why there has been so much acceptance of this war. It's U.S. weapons, not U.S. lives. It's a war against a country demonized in U.S. media for decades and centuries for its actual crimes and for fictions, like imposing Donald Trump on us. And I understand the reluctance to admit that we did that ourselves. It's a war against a Russian invasion of a smaller country. If you're going to protest U.S. invasions, why not protest a Russian invasion? Indeed, but a war is not a protest, it's mass slaughter and destruction. Manipulating good intentions is part of the standard package, and it's our job to help people see through it. Destroying Iraq was marketed in the United States as for the benefit of the Iraqis. The most obviously provoked war in recent years in Ukraine was christened the Unprovoked War. U.S. and other Western diplomats, spies, and theorists predicted for 30 years that breaking a promise and expanding NATO would lead to war with Russia. President Barack Obama refused to arm Ukraine, predicting that doing so would lead toward where we are now, as Obama still saw it in April of last year. Prior to the unprovoked war, there were public comments by U.S. officials arguing that the provocations wouldn't provoke anything. Quote, I don't buy this argument that you know us supplying the Ukrainians with defensive weapons is going to provoke Putin, said Senator Chris Murphy, Democrat of Connecticut. One can still read a RAND report advocating creating a war like this one through the sorts of provocations that senators claimed wouldn't provoke anything. But what can be done? Provoked or not, you have a horrendous, murderous criminal invasion. Now what? Well, now you have endless stalemate with years of killing or nuclear war. You want to do what you can to, quote, help Ukraine. But the millions of Ukrainians who have fled and those who have stayed to face prosecution for peace activism look wiser with the passing of each day. The question is whether keeping a war going is more helpful to Ukrainians or the rest of us then ending it with a compromise aimed at a sustainable peace. According to Ukrainian media and foreign affairs and Bloomberg and Israeli and German and Turkish and French officials, the U.S. pressured Ukraine to prevent peace agreement in the early days of this invasion. 
Since then, the U.S. and allies have provided mountains of free weapons to keep the war going. Eastern European governments have expressed concern that if the U.S. slows or ends the weapons flow, Ukraine might become willing to negotiate peace. Peace is viewed by some on both sides of this war, many of them quite far removed from the fighting, not as a good thing, but as even worse than ongoing slaughter and devastation. Both sides insist on total victory. But that total victory is nowhere in sight, as other voices on both sides quietly admit. And any such victory would not be lasting, as the defeated side would plot vengeance as soon as possible. Yet both sides persist in declaring victory imminent. Yesterday, the New York Times wrote, quote, the images of Russian troops retreating from a village in Ukraine under fire leave little doubt of the impact of cluster munitions, end quote. You're supposed to read that and obediently have little doubt, even if you're pretty sure that videos exist of soldiers retreating under fire from non-cluster munitions. Compromise is a difficult skill. We teach it to toddlers, but not to governments. <laughs> Traditionally, a refusal to compromise, even if it kills us, has more appeal on the political right. But political party means everything in US politics, and the president is a Democrat. So what is a liberal thinking person to do? We have to encourage them to think a bit more or differently. Nearly two years of peace proposals from around the globe almost all include the same elements. Removal of all foreign troops, neutrality for Ukraine, autonomy for Crimea and Donbass, demilitarization, and lifting sanctions. This is a consensus view of expert observers. Should we pay any attention? At this point, some observable action must precede negotiations because trust is non-existent. Either side could announce a ceasefire and ask that it be matched. Either side could announce a willingness to agree to a particular set of agreements, including the elements above. If a ceasefire is not matched, the slaughter could be quickly resumed. If a ceasefire is used to build up troops and weapons for the next battle, well then the sky is also blue and a bear does it in the woods. Nobody imagines either side as capable of switching off the war business that quickly. But a ceasefire is required for negotiations and an end to weapons shipments is required for a ceasefire. These three elements must come together. They could be abandoned together quickly if negotiations fail. But why not try? Yeah. Allow <laughs> Allowing the people of Crimea and Donbass to determine their own fate is a real sticking point for Ukraine. But that solution strikes me as at least as big a victory for democracy as sending more U.S. weapons to Ukraine despite the opposition of the majority of the people of the United States. War is in fact the opposite of democracy and should not be waged in its name. New alliances like BRICS are not international law and will not save us from war, though it's possible that they could move us in that right direction. But a globe with two nations or alliances enforcing Monroe doctrines would surely kill us all. Even one original Monroe doctrine may yet kill us all. So I encourage you to organize a local burial ceremony of the Monroe doctrine on December the 2nd. 200 years is plenty. More than enough. I encourage you to build a bigger movement over the coming months leading up to December 2nd with events that take part in Code Pink's Summer of Peace, ongoing right now, that mark the International Day of Peace on September 21st, 
that include watch parties for World Beyond Wars annual conference online, September 22nd to 24th, that join in Diffuse Nuclear Wars Week of Action, September 24th to 30th, Campaign Nonviolence Weeks of Action, September 21st to October 2nd, the Global Days of Action for Peace in Ukraine, September 30th to October 8th, that Keep Space for Peace Week, October 7th to 14th, Armistice Day, not that other name for it, on November the 11th, and the Merchants of Death Tribunal, November the 12th. There are also wars not in Ukraine, and I encourage you to join World Beyond Wars Africa Conference on November 23rd to 25th online. And if that is not enough work for you all to, to set your hands to, just let me know. There, there's, there is no end up to the supply. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you very, very much.